Thank you so much for joining me today on Just Praise Him Radio. I'm your host, Glenda Lomax, and my job is to inspire you to a closer walk with Christ. Now here's the show. Hello, believers. Welcome to the Just Praise Him radio program. I'm your host, Glenda Lomax, and the title of my message today is Even in Chains, Part 2. We started this two-part series last week. We left off last week after talking about Joseph's integrity and how God was able to use him mightily because of it. Then we talked about Daniel and how God used him mightily due to his integrity, and we left off where Daniel had just survived the den of lions and was promoted. So now we're going to talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now we've talked about them before, but we're going to talk about them some more. Daniel's three wise friends who were also taken into captivity. So there were a bunch of troublemakers among the Babylonians who did not like the Jews and were trying to get rid of them. That was the bottom line. So the king had made an image, this big statue, and commanded everyone, when they heard the music, to bow down to it and worship it. Well, these guys only serve the one true God, like us, and they refused to do that. So Nebuchadnezzar threw a hissy fit and had them brought before his throne. Daniel chapter 3, starting in verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not you serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if you be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made, well. But if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. I love how they answered him. They were like, let us tell you who this God is. I love how they answered him. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now that is not an easy thing to do when you are staring at the fiery furnace across the room, which would have been a commercial size huge oven that was heated up and heated up and heated up some more, And that would be, you know, you're thinking, okay, this is going to hurt, right? That's going to leave a mark. But they were so courageous. And they said, no matter what you do to us, we're just going to serve our God, not yours. So sorry about your luck. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had made the commitment in their hearts that no matter what happened, no matter what they were threatened with, no matter what they were going to suffer, they would remain faithful to Almighty God. If they lived, they were going to live faithful. If they died, they were going to die faithful. Whether God rescued them or he didn't, they would remain faithful. That was their commitment that they made even going into this thing. I think when they were being marched to, you know, Babylon or or wherever it was they were taken, I think that they were thinking in their minds, okay, this is what we're going to do. If need be, that they would stand and burn in the fiery furnace rather than compromise their faith or their integrity. Have you made that same decision? Because when war comes, if you are taken prisoner by communist, by a communist country, they can try to force you to do all kind of things. You have to make the decision ahead of time, and you have to commit to it in your heart and think about it, okay? It's not fun to think about. But because Abshak, Meshach, and Abednego's integrity was so strong, God was able to use them to witness to a pagan king. Because they were willing to stand up for righteousness, God delivered them. Now, if you compromise, he won't deliver you. Can I just tell you that? Do you see that they did the same thing as Daniel and Joseph? They showed integrity and they witnessed of God. That's what Joseph and Daniel did. And God's favor followed integrity. Right out of the fiery furnace without so much as the smell of smoke on them, and nobody had ever come out of that except in as ashes, their hair was not even singed. Daniel 3.27, And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together, saw these men, upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their head singed. 
neither were their coats changed nor the smell of fire passed on them, had passed on them. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego brought God glory and praise and honor. Daniel chapter 3, starting in verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and even their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Can you say amen? You know, if you are in chains, you especially need the favor of God, which all of our patriarchs that we're talking about had because they walked in a spirit of excellence. They walked in incredible integrity, the kind of integrity that cost you something, because integrity will cost you something. Can I just tell you that? It will cost you something. Submission to authority is key when someone has you captive, but only up to the point where it starts conflicting with what God tells us to do. Then you don't submit anymore. That's where the line is. When someone has power over you, there is little use in doing anything else other than praying and praising God because really, only He can help you. But submission in authority only goes as far as it does not conflict with the Word of God. You better know the Word. Just telling you. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could have compromised. They could have said, well, Surely we can do more good if we stay alive by bowing down to the statue. We'll just bow down and we'll tell God we don't mean it. Like, we'll just take the mark, but we'll tell God we don't really worship the beast. Don't fall for that lie. Satan's going to get a lot of people in hell by that lie right there. Because they could have thought, well, we'll just we'll keep on witnessing for him. But first, we've got to do that right, wrong. Because bowing down would have ruined any witnessing they did. It would have ruined their witness. It would have taken all their credibility away. Please hear me on this. It is so important that you understand how to serve God, even if you are in chains. It is so important that you learn to praise Him in spite of your circumstances. Praise Him for your circumstances, even if they're horrible. You want to see a change in your circumstances? Praise Him for the bad stuff, too. Because He's going to bring good out of it, so He's worthy to be praised for it. He's still God no matter what. Just saying. You don't know what opportunities He may be bringing you to have favor in those situations. You must commit to stay faithful no matter what it costs you. Because if you're going to die anyway, which sometimes that will be the case, you want to die faithful, not compromised, all right? And you begin that commitment by practicing it in your life every day right now. Because let me tell you something. I love y'all and I want y'all to go to heaven, okay? But I want you to, to put in a good show down here too, okay? If you are not strong enough to stand in your integrity now, in your home, in your workplace, wherever, do not be deceived into thinking you will become sister and brother super Christian then under the worst possible circumstances because that will not happen. What will happen is your faith will fold up like a house of cards because you will be so afraid that you will believe anything the wicked in power tell you and you will end up following the wrong God home. And there is no way back from that if you do it in this time. Why would you praise God when you're in chains and when you're being held prisoner against your will? Well, I'm glad you asked. But first, let me explain something about praise and worship in case you do not know. Praise and worship are based on who he is, not where we are. Always remember which one of you is God, and I'll give you a hint. It's not you. It's not me. It's only him. And you know what? It could be that you and me and most everybody else listening to this will be excluded from the bottom of the boat scenario many rounds talked about on the podcast some months ago on JPH Radio. So let's not let something that may never happen steal whatever joy is left to us today. I know you're apprehensive about all that's coming. I am too. How can we not be? Because we know a lot of what's coming. But you know what? I want y'all to remember this. If you read the back of the book, we win. We win. We just have to stay faithful in the time left to us until we are called home and we win. 
I want to read you a note from my study Bible that sums it up, this up so well. Daniel served for 70 years in a foreign land that was hostile to God, yet he did not compromise his faith in God. He was truthful, persistent in prayer, and disinterested in power for personal glory. God was faithful in Daniel's life. He delivered him from prison, from a den of lions, and from enemies who hated him. That says it all, don't it? Y'all, we need to strive to be content to serve God wherever He puts us. It is not about us. It's about Jesus and bringing souls to Him and bringing Him glory. It's not about us. It's not about what we go through. There's a book called Tortured for Christ. It's, I believe, the story of Richard Wormbrand, who was tortured in Romania, and then God sent him to America to witness over here. He's gone home to be with the Lord now, but it's a really good story if you can bear to read it. It's pretty tough, you know, looking at at the things that can happen, but he was so strong in that, you know, he held on through that. And God paid back the people that did it. It is clear from these stories in the Word of God that God will create circumstances if you are taken captive in order that you may be shown favor so you may witness of his mighty power to your unbelieving captors. There are circumstances God allows for his people to be used to witness and give him the glory while in captivity. But the other side of that coin is you must do your part then. And like Joseph, like Daniel, like the three Hebrews, you must walk in absolute integrity and you must witness of him boldly even when faced with possible death. How Joseph, Daniel, and Abshak, Meshach, and Abednego must have hated it and missed their friends and families when they were taken captive. But remember how they did not get wrapped around the chariot axle about that. They just continued to serve God. They had learned in whatever situation they were in how to be abased, how to abound everywhere in all things. And we know that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, Philippians 4, 12 and 13. Daniel did it in the lion's den. He held on and God closed the mouths of the lions. Abshak, Meshach and Abednego, when coming out of the fiery furnace, gave God honor and witness to a pagan king. And even though God allowed them to be, he allowed them to be thrown into the fiery furnace. Now, there's a lot of people who say, well, if he allows me to be thrown in there, I'm done. You know, I'm done. But the result was God was exalted. A pagan king then not only believed in God, but decreed everybody else under his rule must also worship that God, our God. And then all the three Hebrews were promoted. So many people spend their lives chasing wealth and honor. But the Bible tells you everything you need to know to gain those things. Psalm 75, for promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south, but God is the judge. He puts down one and sets up another. Proverbs 22, 4, by humility and fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Humility is the tough part in that one. Because to get humility... You have to crucify your pride or let God do it for you. POWs or prisoners of war are often abused in various ways. We all know this. I don't think this is supposed to happen, and I think there are laws against it, but it does happen. I had an uncle, may he rest in peace, who was a POW in World War II. I asked him about it once when I was a teen, but he would not even talk about it. He was still too traumatized. I asked my only surviving uncle last year if he had ever heard the stories about Uncle Cullen's POW experience, but he also said he would never talk about it. It was so horrific. He was taken prisoner by the Japanese. I have seen and read stories about how POWs were treated then, and it would take a lot to get through that, especially if it went on for very long. I I never heard that Uncle Cullen had PTSD, but from what I know about what their captivity in that time was like, it would be surprising if he did not. If you are taken captive, let me give you some hints of things you can do. Or if it's the same things you do if you're in a, an abusive relationship that you cannot escape. Okay, it's the same things. Worship. And you can do that silently. Commune with God in your heart. Remind yourself of the scriptures you know. Remind yourself of the goodness of God. 
in your mind, in your heart. Pray, 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 pray. Comfort, show comfort and kindness to others like Jesus would do in hard situations. We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Joseph did that in the prison, remember? Witness to others. We are called to be lights in dark places. I can't imagine a place that would be much darker than that. Our circumstances when war comes may be uncomfortable, but look what Jesus went through for us. It was not comfortable on the cross. Can I just say that? It was not comfortable when he was being flogged with a cat of nine tails or when he was thrown in a cold prison cell that night waiting for crucifixion the next morning and knowing it was coming. If you are taken captive, pray for your captors, for the Lord to save them. Remember, our real enemy is not a person. It's Satan. I was talking to many rounds, and he shared a revelation that he got. We were talking about this. We were talking, and he said, when Jesus said, follow me, he said, that might mean all the way to the cross. You know, there were Christians taken captive by Hamas. And they are living through this very thing right now. How do you serve him in chains? The same way you serve him when you're free, when you're truly committed. An abusive marriage is a type of captivity because you are not free to just go if you want to leave. People think you are, but you're not. So many people judge battered women saying, well, why why didn't you just leave? I was in an abusive marriage for almost 12 years, so I want to explain this to you. It is not that simple, and only those who have been there or been close to someone who has know it is not that simple. The violence you suffer increases by over 80% the minute you leave. It's quite an accomplishment to get out. If you do leave, it is under threat of death. For all of you who wonder why abused women or men do not leave their abusive spouses, this is almost always the reason. That and the threat of never seeing your children again because they threaten you with that too. It takes a lot to get out of one of those marriages. When I left in 1987, I had to go to a women's shelter 300 miles away. They constantly tell you, if you leave, I will kill you. And you know they really will. My husband went looking for me with with a rifle one time, y'all, when I left. That rifle was not so he could hunt dinner when he found me. I remember with great clarity the last several months I was with him. He made it a point for some reason in that particular time, as if it were not bad enough, we had both been out of work for a month and even had to resort to going to the food pantry to get some food to eat and feed our children, which we had never done before. He made it a point to tell me every day that if I ever left him, he would kill me and how he would kill me in some pretty horrific detail. I knew that he would back those words up in great rage if I got out and he was able to find me. And I lived in fear of that every day. I had lived in fear for all but the first six months or so of that almost 12-year marriage. The stress of all those years of fear has manifested in terrible ways in my body over the last five or ten years especially. You think that your body is not reacting that badly to stress. On the outside, maybe it's not. But on the inside... There are effects you cannot see, and the damage is real. Especially in relation to abuse situations where you have had to hold everything you feel inside on top of enduring the beatings. Just know if you are in one of those very unfortunate situations now or in the future. I knew to escape I would have to go further than just a few miles, so I went to another state. I fled to Oklahoma and a few days later checked into a shelter. I remember the manager at the shelter told me it would take me about a month to get a job there. It was a tiny town in western Oklahoma, and there were very few jobs of any kind because oil was down. There was a little oil in the area, but there was no nothing going on with it. And I remember thinking it had never taken me a month to get a job anywhere. I had a job within a week, and not only a job, but my first job in management. I was at the Battered Women's Shelter, I think, four or six weeks before I had saved up enough money to rent a place on my own. I talked to that women's shelter months later and found out I was the only woman in that time period who did not return to her abuser. The difference was I had studied and prepared myself mentally before I left that time, since I had gone back all the times before. I read books about it at work on my lunch hours and made a plan for when I was finally able to get out. I did not know when that would be, and I had almost no money when I left. 
but I had the plan and made it work. In the late 90s, more than 10 years after I got out, I did some volunteer work briefly at one of the North Dallas area women's shelters because I wanted to give back, you know. I still remember how all the women were amazed I had gotten out and lived to tell about it. It gave them hope. And the, the counselor at that shelter hated me. She hated me so bad because the women would talk to me and they wouldn't talk to her. She tried to keep it where I couldn't, get, I couldn't come in. But that was because I had been in their shoes and she had not. And probably, you know, maybe she was one of the people that judged them for going back. I don't know or for staying. But here's another reason you should never, ever judge a battered wife or husband. They don't just threaten you. They threaten your children and they threaten to harm your family as well. One of the times I left, <clears throat> I went to my older brother's house. My husband called there, demanded to talk to me, and he told me very calmly, either you come out or I'm going to blow my way in there with this shotgun and get you out. What would you do? Say, yeah, come on in and blow my family away? Never, ever judge someone who is in an abusive marriage. I can tell you for a fact, you don't know the half of what they're enduring. Like all abused women, I suffered greatly in the captivity of that abuse. But I also learned submission and other things while I was in it that allowed me to minister to others when I finally did get out. My captivity was turned into spiritual food for other people. Harriet Tubman was only six years old when she was made to go to work. She escaped when she was 27 and returned to her native Maryland at least 13 times to rescue family and friends over the next 10 years. Now, you know that took courage, going back to where you used to be a slave or you were, you know, imprisoned or you were in captivity. She learned in her captivity and used what she learned to help others in very big ways. Harriet Tubman's captivity was turned into spiritual food for other people. Richard Wormbrand, captured and tortured for 14 years by communists, then went on to write a book, Tortured for Christ, and continued to spread the gospel. He wrote more than 18 books. He and his wife, Sabina, immigrated to America where he spent his life helping persecuted Christians. Richard Wormbrand's captivity was turned into spiritual food for other people. The list of examples of people taken captive who turned those lemons into lemonade is endless. But the bottom line is this. Many people hearing my voice right now will be taken captive in the future and what is coming. So we need to talk about how the Lord would have you to handle that. The book of Nahum is about Nineveh's judgment. They got a reprieve when Jonah finally did what God called him to do. Unfortunately, their repentance was short-lived. Thus, they went back to their old ways and ended up far worse than than what they were. Before his coming, um, 150 years later, Nahum comes and judgment finally comes upon Nineveh. Nobody wants to be in captivity, but it could be the Lord has one person he wants you to witness to, and that's the only way he can set that up. But there are things you can do to survive captivity, and the Lord wants us to worship him and serve him even under those harsh conditions. So that is what we're going to talk about. Remember the things I told you. What will help you the most? Humility, submit to authority, only as, as, as far as it does not conflict with the Word of God. Pray. See the situation through spiritual eyes. God may have a, a, something for you to do there. Don't love your life. Focus on the mission at hand. The mission is witness for God, glorify Him, and walk in integrity. Commune with God in your heart. Worship God in your heart. And keep your head down. Okay? Comfort and be kind to others because we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Like Joseph, serve at every opportunity and serve with humility. Humility and honest work will help you a lot. Abshak, Meshach, and Abednego, stand in your integrity and let it shine. We are called to be lights in dark places. Our circumstances in war or captivity may be uncomfortable, but look at all Jesus suffered for us. He wasn't comfortable. He wasn't comfortable getting flogged or being in that cold cell that night. He wasn't comfortable being on that cross. Look at everything the disciples went through. They weren't comfortable. Don't you think they would have rather gone back home and been out on their fishing boats and doing what they knew how to do best? Pray for your captors, for the Lord to save them. Most of all, 
Remember, our real enemy is not a person. It's Satan. And remember, too, remember there was a centurion that got saved because of, I believe it was because of Paul. Paul was in captivity. He was being led to Jerusalem, I think, to be brought before. Um, I forget now who was in, in power then. But um, our real enemy is not a person. It's Satan. And remember, when Jesus said, follow me, that might mean all the way to the cross. Will you still follow him if it does? Because a lot of people won't. A lot of people are going to turn back and go, uh, no, don't sign me up for that. How you serve him, even in chains, is the same way you should be serving him while you're free. You should be standing in your integrity now, witnessing at every opportunity, walking in humility, and serving every chance you get. Are you doing that? Because if you do it now, it will come naturally to you to do it then. It is also going to be the case for some people because they refuse to submit now and let God refine them that he's going to have them taken into captivity to refine them that way. It's a lot harder conditions if you wait. If you think you're one of those people, I highly advise that you say, Lord, go ahead and do it now because I don't want it being done that way because it will help you. If anybody under the sound of my voice is not saved and you want to be saved, I would like to to issue you an invitation into the worldwide family of God. All you have to do is say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Please save me. I want to come to heaven and be with you after I die. Change my life and make it better. I believe that you are the Son of God. And if you will say that right now in Jesus' name, amen, you are saved. Okay? You're saved and God will begin to work with you on your life. He doesn't expect you to give everything up immediately. I thought that he did, and I would have gotten saved sooner if somebody had told me that was not the way that goes. He will help you give things up, though, so that your life will be more peaceful. You can have real peace with Jesus. Did you know that? Real peace, where you're calm all the time and peaceful. That comes when you give up the sin. Yep. Sin takes away your peace. He's a good God, and I highly, highly recommend him. That's one decision in my life that was actually a really good decision that I will never regret. I hope this has been a blessing to y'all. Jesus bless you. Thanks for listening. Y'all have a great week. Thank you so much for tuning in today to Just Praise Him Radio. I hope this has inspired you to a closer walk with Christ. You can contact me by mail at my new address, JPH Inc., P.O. Box 854, Altus, Oklahoma. That's A-L-T-U-S, Oklahoma 73522. Or by email at wingsofprophecy at gmail.com. JPH is not affiliated with any nonprofit organization, church, or denomination.